Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your divine love. In the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, once again, good morning and welcome everyone. Here we are in the course on bioethical um, issues in uh, environmental uh, uh, science, uh, environmental bioethics, and in the Masters of Bioethics at St. Thomas University. We're going to be looking at energy now, All right? So this is our, uh, what, fifth lecture? Is that fifth lecture? Yeah. If you think for a moment, let's uh, look back because we're kind of halfway now. And so far we looked at uh, the geosphere. In other words, the, essentially the crust of the earth where life occurs and how that came about. Then we looked at the atmosphere, keeping the air that keeps that life alive, right? Supplying the gases necessary. Then we look at the hydrosphere, supplying the liquids necessary for that life to uh, flourish. And then last uh, course, last uh, lecture, we looked at cycles, cycles in nature, um, meaning the dynamic movement of essential molecules uh, for life, water, carbon dioxide, um, what else, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. All right. And at the tail end of that, human recycling. So you see we're transitioning a little bit. We got uh, the natural component, and then we got the ethical component built in. And again, noticing that we are the only species that produces actual trash that does not reintegrate back into nature in contrast to everything else that's living around us, then that is a challenge, that is a concern, and it's all about the footprint, right? Trying to minimize our footprint so that it is more eco-friendly. So this is the big picture. If you look at these four lectures as a whole, I've been talking about matter, the visible matter, again, dipping back a little bit. Remember the component of the universe we have these four categories, right? Visible or measurable, we should say empirical uh, matter, empirical energy, and then there is dark energy and dark matter, right? And it's only a small percentage, what is it, about one-fifth uh, of the universe, it's only measurable, or what I'm calling visible or uh, measurable matter and energy. Mm -hmm. So there's a big unknown out there that we can only infer indirectly. Uh, however, sticking back to planet Earth, which is the only one we know that has uh, life. Oh, sorry. Okay. Also, I want to consider the, um, the energy aspect because so far we've been looking at matter, essentially matter on Earth, whether it's biotic or abiotic. And we've been looking mostly at abiotic uh, factors that provide for the possibility of life, right? Uh, but now we need to look a little bit at energy. You notice that that's going to be, that has been, continues to be the big challenge for uh, the human impact, the human um, footprint, right, on Earth, is energy sources that are more eco-friendly because so far traditionally we have been depending on fossil fuel is the cheapest source of energy that we have to this day, whether it's gas, liquid, or solid. And so to make that transition is challenging, is difficult, but as they say in the business world, the challenge is the opportunity, right? It's what pushes creativity to find new sources of energy that are more eco-friendly. So that's what uh, today's lecture is going to be about. We're going to be focusing on energy and energy sources. So we have right off the bat fossil fuels, then nuclear energy, solar, wind, hydroelectric, geothermal, wood, biomass, biofuels, other sources, and finally ending with the natural right to energy because without energy, we just can't live. We need to supply energy into uh, the body and into our social milieu, as it were. So 
Any questions so far, any comments? If there's nothing, I'm going to uh, move forward then. With regards to renewable or non-renewable, we can classify energy into these two large categories, non-renewable and renewable, okay? Non-renewable and renewable. And you notice that whereas we have more renewable sources of energy, qualitatively, there's a greater variety of renewable sources of energy. What do we mean by renewable? That it is um, eco-friendly. It can be recycled back into nature and it has uh, not a big impact, but rather it's uh, amenable to the environment that's around us. And so it's preferable. <clears throat> However, qualitatively, there's a greater variety, but quantitatively, the challenge quantitatively is that together they supply much less of the current energy needs that we have in society, as opposed to the two non-renewable, which are fossil fuels and nuclear, all right? So fossil fuel and nuclear are the two um, highest energy sources that we have in society today, but they uh, don't have a positive impact in general on the environment or to lower their footprint is also costly. It's costly because of filters and so forth. So let's uh, look at uh, non-renewable first and understand them in a little greater detail, qualitatively and quantitatively, and then move into the renewables. So fossil fuels are three types. Sorry, it's a work in progress here, it's a little tile. Yeah. Fossil fuels are of three types. They come in, in uh, three varieties, even though they have the same origin, if you will, geologic origin. Uh, they are uh, solid, is coal. Liquid is petroleum, even though it's thick, but it's liquid. And then mm, gas, natural gas, natural gas. And these are organic compounds, all right? Organic compounds that we know have been compressed uh, through geological time into the layers of the earth, into the sediment, down into the crust at various depths. And these fossil fuels are named such because they come from fossils, all right? Now, um, some people erroneously think that this is mostly the dinosaurs that died about uh, 65 million years ago, mostly probably because of that meteorite impact in the Yucatan Peninsula. And so they became mush, they became uh, petroleum. But however, the animal component of fossil fuels is minimal, all right? What is the biggest component of fossil fuel, the biggest life component, organic component? If it's not animals, then it has to be plants. Plants. Exactly, plants. All right, so when you think a little bit, think in ecological terms again, in any particular environment that we look at, generally, generally we see many more plants than we see animals, okay? In fact, you can be looking at a forest that is very lush, whether it's a tropical rainforest or a temperate forest or a coniferous forest, whichever one of the three main zones, right? Mm. And you're going to see mostly trees, you're going to see mostly plants, and you may be lucky to see a few animals around, <laughs> but it's mostly plants. So biomass, think of biomass quantitatively to make all that petroleum, to make all that organic material, it was mostly forest, huge, vast forests throughout the world. And I also want to dovetail a little bit into the Remember we talked about four glacial and interglacial periods uh, last lecture. In the, in the past half million years only, remember the earth is four and a half billion years. We have life on earth around 3.8 to 4 billion years ago, all right? And how many millions is a billion? A thousand million. And only in the past half million years, so very recently in geologic time, very recently in geologic time, 
uh, we had already four ice ages. We really don't know that much before that, but at least in the half million years, we have had four of these glacial and interglacial periods. What does that mean? During the glacial period, that essentially the northern hemisphere and whatever landmass is in the southern hemisphere was covered with glaciers. Uh, and when we talk about glaciers, we're talking about one to two miles of ice on top of the crust of the earth, on top of the continents, one to two miles high, all right? Thick, not wide. <laughs> wide would be the width of the continents. And so it is absolutely massive. But also, again, thinking uh, with our mind's eye, that ice is mostly fresh water, right? So it's fresh water that is taken up by all this ice. And that fresh water, one way or another, had to come mostly from evaporation in the ocean. So the ocean uh, surface was much lower than what it is today, okay? In the ocean depth, and therefore there was also more coast exposed because the ocean depth was lower. That's what we call a winterization of the earth. Very drastic conditions, uh, animals and plants generally move south and particularly in North America into the Florida Peninsula because the Florida Peninsula was never covered by glaciers, all right? So it was like a safe haven, it was an island of land where these plants and animals could survive, including the slash pine that we have here on campus, which I've mentioned uh, dates back to about 10 to 12,000 years ago, which was when the last ice age receded, right? And at the low end, so those are the peaks of, um, of um, ice age or winterization, at the opposite end, where we have that the temperatures were above freezing for a substantial period of time and significantly high, then all that ice slowly melts down to uh, essentially no ice, natural ice on Earth, significantly on the poles, which is where we have the vast majority of ice, right? The, the two poles. So when there was no ice on Earth, essentially because the temperature was too warm, then we have what we call is a tropicalization of the earth, tropicalization. And we have again, four of those coinciding in, in between the, the winterization, all right? Between the glass age, the ice ages. And those are called interglacial periods, interglacial. And at that time, because all that ice from the poles melted, then it's understood that the sea level was a higher and therefore less coast right, the sea, the surface, the shoreline came in because the ocean rose to about, it's considered anywhere between 100 to 200 uh, feet of what we have today, higher, 100 to 200 feet higher. What does that say about the Florida Peninsula? That it was underwater, right, underwater because the average depth of at least South Florida, I'm sorry, the average uh, height above sea level of South Florida was about six to eight feet. <laughs> All right, so we would have essentially 100 to 200 feet of salt water above us, of ocean, which means that essentially the Gulf of Mexico was uh, continuous with the um, Atlantic Ocean. And not only that, it actually went into the Mississippi Valley. And uh, there was back then during the tropicalization of the earth, there was something called the Mississippi Sea. The Mississippi Sea was kind of the Gulf up there and all that sediment uh, on the Great Plains was below water on the ocean floor. And that's why we find fossils in the, mid, in the um, Midwest, uh, there are fossils in that sediment because that used to be the Mississippi Sea. Okay, so less landmass. And that's what we say that today we are in between a glacial period and a full interglacial period. We're somewhere in between with an inter, a winterization or a tropicalization of the earth because we don't have one to two miles of ice on top of the continents, and we don't have one to 200 uh, feet of water above us. <laughs> so we have to be somewhere in between. And the big guess is which way are we going? Are we going to a water winterization or a tropicalization? Because we need data for that, but we need long-term data. 
geologic time to get a slope, right? To see if the slope is positive or negative on the temperature, we need um, we need timelines on the on the graph, and but we need it in geologic time, which is minimally thousands, hundreds of thousands of years is better, and even millions of years is better, or but at least hundreds of thousands of years, and we just don't have the benefit of that type of data on temperature yet. Mm -hmm. All right, so <clears throat> backing out a little bit from that, the last thing I want to say about the tropical ascension of the Earth is because there were no, there was no ice on the poles, and it was essentially a tropical climate throughout the entire Earth that can explain why we have uh, oil in Alaska, right? We have oil in Alaska, and today Alaska is very cold. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that means that uh, at one time Alaska was tropicalized to have a lush tropical rainforest right, tropical rainforest, which eventually died and it was buried in sediment and under pressure and temperature, that forest rotted. And it rotted into petroleum, basically, the black guck that we call petroleum or black gold, right? And with further compression on that petroleum, that petroleum eventually becomes hard and that it becomes solid and that is coal, all right? So uh, a forest that has rotted and compressed by sediment becomes uh, petroleum and petroleum that gets further compressed by more sedimentation and pressure becomes uh, coal. And if we further compress coal, what's the main, one of the main components of fossil fuels by way of elements. That is one of the main elements, right? These are organic, this is organic material, right? And organic material is made up of the four main macromolecules, the four main organic molecules, the four main groups of organic molecules, which are? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Well, you're down to the level of elements, but uh, the four main groups of carbon, the four main groups of organic molecules, four main groups still in the bigger picture, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, right? Those are the four main groups of organic molecules. But whatever group to qualify as an organic molecule, to qualify as an organic molecule, it needs at least two elements that you mentioned. The two elements are? carbon and hydrogen, not necessarily oxygen. Oxygen is in many um, organic molecules, but it's not required, all right? Uh, methane, for example, doesn't have oxygen. It has carbon and hydrogen, but uh, it needs carbon and hydrogen. And of the two, the most uh, significant one is gonna be carbon, right? Because the hydrogen is basically coating the, the organic molecule to stabilize it anatomically or um, uh, with the polarity, but the carbon is the high energy molecule because of the carbon-carbon bond, the covalent bond between carbons, what typically forms a skeleton of organic molecules, right? The backbone, and that's the high energy bond there. That's the bond that is broken with combustion, with burning, whether it's burning in industry or burning through the organic process of what? cellular respiration, respiration, right? Which is the burning of fossil fuel, <laughs> not fossil, but uh, fuel, the burning of organic molecules, mostly glucose, to obtain the energy for recharging ATPs and maintaining metabolism, so the energy source. All right, so it's a carbon-carbon bond, the covalent bond there. And um, we have then these three sources. Also, uh, that petroleum, as it's separating, uh, little by little, it's going to seep out gas, natural gas of different kinds, propane, butane, methane, all these natural gases that are stored in layers in the sediment down uh, deep into the crust of the earth. All right, so these are the three main sources of fossil fuels, coal, petroleum, and uh, natural gas. And there are some photos here of um, a 
mine, a coal mine, which is known as a strip mine, because basically when there is a hill or a mountain or even a mountain range that has a lot of coal in it, well, the, these uh, trucks, the industry will go in and just strip that mountain uh, on the sides uh, for they'll mine directly on the side of the mountain. And that's why it's called strip mining. It's obviously very damaging to the mountain itself. It exposes that coal, but it's the cheapest way of getting coal. And the coal itself is a high energy uh, source, right? Uh, alternative, and here is a, a factory that is processing coal. As you can see, it arrives from these huge dump trucks in, in large uh, bulk, and then is channeled into the, uh, the factory itself where that coal is uh, essentially burnt. And the burning process uh, generates high, uh, boils water into steam. So the basic transition, we need to go from chemical energy to uh, electricity basically, right? To produce electricity, to put into the grid, to run industry. So that's the major use of <clears throat> energy in society is to run industry, to manufacture all of the stuff that we use for living. And so, there has to be an energy transition from the chemical energy, which is potential energy stored in the carbon-carbon uh, bond, in the covalent bond, to electricity. But that's not done directly, it's done indirectly through an intermediate. And the intermediate is steam, water vapor. Water vapor, we know, expands, right, because it's gas. And so what it does is that vapor is channeled into turbines. And turbines, when the turbines, uh, turn, they generate electricity. So a turbine will uh, friction the rotor with a stator and that static electricity then uh, will generate electricity that is put into the grid. So to produce the steam, we need to boil the water. To boil the water, we need to add heat to it. And that's why the fossil fuels are burned to uh, boil water uh, especially the coal at the industrial level. And then that vapor is used to uh, run those turbines. I want to point out though that uh, many times you see these types of photos where you have these chimneys putting out white smoke and people say, oh my God, look at all the CO2 that these factories are producing. But not such, at least in countries that are civilized and that abide by rules, by regulation, government regulation, it is absolutely forbidden to throw CO2 into the atmosphere like this when we burn the fossil fuel, all right? What you're seeing here is actually water vapor. In other words, these stacks, these smoke stacks, have inside filters, and these filters trap CO2 gas. The CO2 gas is a product of burning, all right? And so that CO2 needs to be trapped so that it doesn't increase those gigatons of uh, CO2 that we are producing every year through that, remember the, um, the uh, budget, the carbon budget uh, that I showed you uh, last class, all right? So I say in governments, when, when the government is not corrupt and the laws are in place and are actually enacted, so this industry is regulated and therefore that's expense of the, of the industry to obtain that energy, they need to spend also on filters, which by the way, typically those filters are charcoal filters. So part of the coal is also used uh, to absorb the CO2 as filters, all right? Okay, so has, that's how coal works. It's mostly to generate electric, electricity through turbines run by water vapor. In contrast, petroleum is refined in a refinery, all right? And the petroleum is refined to, into several different components, mostly liquid components, but even plastics. Many of the plastics also come out of the petroleum because petroleum is a very rich, rich guck, all right? That black guck is incredibly high in all kinds of organic molecules that can be used in industry, 
gasolines, turpentines, solvents, uh, oils, um, uh, and also gas that is uh, that comes out of of the petroleum. And so I'm thinking that future generations will look at us with dismay to think that an organic compound that is as complex and rich as petroleum, that we essentially burnt it to get energy out of it. Because there, there is so much richness in that organic compound. You think that these are rotted forests uh, in immense quantity. So the biomass that is concentrated in there is just tremendous. And when you take it all the way down to the carbon-carbon bonds that are stored in petroleum, it is absolutely uh, huge, all right? And so we have to come up with more creative ways of using that petroleum other than burning it, because burning it, uh, even in refineries as sophisticated like these, it's rather primitive. Mm -hmm. To find better ways of using that petroleum so that it's eco-friendly and at the same time, we're not burning it, all right? So we know that there are uh, plants uh, for extracting petroleum and natural gas, whether on land or on sea. And these are these uh, huge uh, platforms. And this is excess. Uh, this is just the burning, uh, mostly methane, but uh, other gases that are a byproduct of extracting that uh, petroleum, all right? So they always have to have this plume way out there uh, to burn that excess gas that accumulates in the pipes and so forth as the petroleum is being extracted. So this is kind of a safety thing so that a whole uh, platform doesn't explode. I think I have a diagram here, yeah. Uh, coal plant, well, this is reiterating a little bit uh, what I was saying. Here is the burning of the coal, which produces CO2, which is filtered. Uh, so really what comes out of here is mostly steam. Uh, but here is the boiler, which uh, heats up the water into steam also. And here is a turbine that is being turned by that steam, generating electricity. So this is an, a generator, an electro, electrical generator. And that electricity then is pumped into the grid, into the grid for running our uh, our electricity. Typically, these coal plants are near rivers or lakes so as to use the water to cool down the uh, steam and to cool down all the machinery and as a source of water also for being heated up into steam. But at least in principle, this water that is coming in and out of the coal plant should be isolated you follow all these pipes, the blue and white pipes, they should be isolated from the burning process and the coal process itself so that the river itself is not contaminated with any of the byproducts of the coal uh, burning. With regards to um, gas, natural gas, uh, one that has become very popular now and also uh, a cheap source of energy is fracking. And fracking is a contraction of words of hydraulic fracturing, hydraulic fracturing. So fracturing is a reference to the layers, the sedimentary layers of the crust of the earth. Okay? And um, in the fractures or layers, the horizontal layers of sediment, uh, natural gas is trapped in there. So the idea is how to get that natural gas out so that it can be used for industry. And it's done by a hydraulic mechanism. So this is telling you that water is involved here. So let's look at fracking for a moment, how it's done. Here is a fracking uh, plant. There's another one here, all right? And what uh, the idea is the actual uh, natural gas is trapped down here in this gray layer that, as you can see, has coal, but it's coal that is, is not easy to mine because it's so deep into the earth. We're talking two to three 
kilometers or one to two miles down the crust, all right? One, that one to two miles down the surface of the earth. So this type of coal down here is not mm, easy to mine. It, it would be super expensive and it's not, uh, what do you call that? It's not uh, economically, uh, doesn't leave a profit. It's going to be way too expensive to mine this type of coal. The coal that is mined, like I said, is mostly by strip mining, is toward the surface of the earth, all right? So we leave this coal alone, but this coal also has some petroleum in it and natural gas that is continuously uh, separating, if you will, and the natural gas is getting trapped in this sedimentary layer of a rock that is called shale. Shale, all right? And so that has natural gas trapped in it. So how to get to that? And what uh, happens is water is pumped down into the coal region and to a lower shale region, right? And that water is pumped down there, but it's not just uh, pure clean water, or that would be extremely expensive, of course. Rather, it's brine. And brine is water with high mineral content and also some sand. So it's a mixture. It's, uh, it's a solution and it's also a suspension, right? Because it has salt and it also has uh, sand in it. And the idea is to pump this water down there under pressure so that that brine gets into the shale, all right, and fractures it. And as it fractures the shale, the shale, it would release the, uh, the gas that is trapped in there, is trapped. So you can think of it functionally, that brine that is being pumped down is, um, is displacing the gas, which is then absorbed. So the gas is absorbed in the same brine, right? And it, that gas will naturally move up toward the surface, and then in the surface, it is uh, processed and uh, captured for natural gas in uh, tanks, all right, or piped. And so that's the basic concept of fracking is to pump brine under high pressure one or two miles down into the coal and shale region to fracture it, to crack the stone down there, to crack these layers. And by cracking it, releasing the natural gas that is trapped in there, and then that natural gas being recovered through the same pipe, through the same uh, uh, piping system, and piped for use in industry, in commerce, whatever we use natural gas. Okay. All right, now, mm, the positive of this is that the natural gas is there. And a few years ago, I remember seeing in the news that mm, in the United States, uh, these layers of natural gas, deposits of natural gas have been discovered. One of the, some of the largest natural gas deposits in the world are in the US underneath mostly the Midwest in that sedimentary layer because there we have about one to two miles precisely of sedimentation, okay? In the, in the Midwest, the Great Plains, and we have one of the largest deposits of natural gas just sitting below the surface of the United States, of the continent. So that's kind of the positive in the sense that it's a very cheap energy source that is sitting right underneath our feet a few miles down. The negative is that this industry is not without its uh, side effects. Some of that natural gas seeps through the layers as can be seen here in the white arrow. And as it slowly seeps through the different layers of sedimentation, it may be released to the atmosphere, mostly methane. And methane is a greenhouse gas in much lower quantity than CO2, but methane is a higher greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So methane absorbs more heat, retains more heat capacity 
than, than CO2, all right? So even a smaller amount of methane does a larger damage to world global warming. So that's one challenge there. There's also leakage from the pipes through because we're talking about gas, right? And that gas can seep through and cause the same thing and also contaminate the water tables, several layers. So the blue here are water tables, right? Groundwater that we saw in the water cycle uh, last lecture that can also get contaminated with these natural gases, which then makes it less available for drinking or for human consumption. And so that's another uh, negative side effect. Mm. However, if the industry is careful about doing all this, that can also be minimized by using a little more sophisticated technology, better pipes and so forth, more careful with the fracking procedure that is being done. Another one that is uh, kind of a big negative in the popular mind is the possibility of generating earthquakes or tremors. They're not really that strong, these tremors, but when this fracturing is occurring down here, of course, we're shifting a little bit. The, we're unsettling that sedimentary layer and that can cause some undulation, some uh, repercussion of a sound wave, if you will, or, or a fracturing wave uh, up and down where the fracture is occurring. And when that wave hits the surface, it will generate a tremor of some sort. Typically, they're not that strong and only local areas tend to feel it. But if this is in the rural area of the US and the Midwest and the breadbasket, then some of those towns out there may feel some tremor, some shaking, some earthquake. And uh, it may cause, I, in my opinion, my personal opinion, uh, I think that it's more the scare than anything else, all right? But certainly the buildings in those areas need to be um, up to code and up to speed so that they don't collapse, barns and whatever else. And also the, the habitable buildings need to be up to a certain code so that they don't collapse with these uh, tremors, all right? But that's just my personal opinion. I think it's, it's more the scare of feeling the ground uh, shake than the actual damage, the physical damage that it does. So that's fracking. And so it has that negative connotation. Sadly, again, in my personal opinion, I think that fracking has gotten a bad rep from some uh, enthusiasts of the environment and uh, with perhaps no ill intention, I don't pass judgment on the conscience, but perhaps misinformation about the process and uh, fracking has gotten a lot of bad rap, uh, especially in secular media that is so damaging to the environment and so damaging to the human uh, people who live in that area. Uh, but you can see that the process itself is much more benevolent that has been pictured in the news, okay? And considering the fact that we sit on such high deposits of uh, natural gas, uh, well, it's a way of uh, trying to alleviate the, the high demand that our society has, our contemporary society has for energy and for energy sources, okay? Because we, in our consumption mentality, we need a lot of energy to run the lifestyles that uh, we hold dear to us uh, in, in our uh, civilized world. Okay, so that's fracking. There's much more detail, which I'm not familiar with, but basically that's the big picture. Let's look a little bit at the breakdown of how uh, petroleum is refined into various products. Most of it is for fuels, about 85% of it, but you see that there's still a 15% left that is not fuels. And that is taken up over here in this slice of the pie, all right? Uh, for example, uh, asphalt, uh, heavy fuel oil that is used for industry, lubricants and other products, including plastics. So here are the plastics, okay? That come from the uh, fossil fuels or uh, petroleum specifically. Of the fuels, it's mostly gasoline. So about half, more or less about half of the petroleum that is used today is for gasoline, uh, which excludes jet fuel. So this gasoline is mostly to run our cars and our trucks and our trailers, uh, 
Okay, so this is mostly our consumer mentality lifestyle of the cars, the trucks, uh, the, the SUVs, all of that stuff. So we are driving that industry by consumption, we consumers, okay? And this whole thing of consumption and production, and I don't wanna get into the, the vicious cycle of uh, a dog chasing its own tail, but that's what uh, drug users and drug dealers say, well, if there was no demand for drugs, we wouldn't be producing it, right? Uh, so uh, we have to be aware that about half of the gasoline consumption today is because we are demanding it, we consumers. Then jet fuel, which is, uh, tends to produce a lot of CO2 because it's so refined. Jet fuel is about 10% of it, more or less. And then the diesel, this diesel is what is going to run mostly the, the trucking industry at the commercial level and the industrial level. Uh, trucking and including also um, trains for moving cargo, all right? So that's over here in this quarter, approximately one quarter of the petroleum is used for uh, diesel. All right, so that's the current state of affairs. You see that one way or another, everybody is uh, complicit in this demand for petroleum for uh, fuels and lubricants, uh, including the plastics up here. Now, let's look at nuclear for a moment. Any questions on the uh, fossil fuel side of things? We're gonna look at a comparative table how we have been shifting slowly but surely away from fossil fuels, at least in the United States, toward alternative energies, okay? Including nuclear. Any questions, comments? All right, let's look at nuclear for a while. Nuclear, of course, comes from a nuclear reaction, but again, that nuclear reaction is not used by itself, but rather to generate heat, to boil water, to use the steam. And the steam is again used for generating electricity through turbines, right? And so the end product of nuclear uh, energy source is electricity that's pumped into the grid. Therefore, in these stacks, small stacks uh, of uh, energy plants of uh, uh, nuclear energy, this is not CO2 that is being pumped to the atmosphere. This is not radiation that's being pumped to the atmosphere, okay, from spent fuel of uh, the nuclear reactor. No, this is water vapor. Just evaporation, this is uh, contributing to the cloud formation. Mm -hmm. All right, but they're also near rivers, at least the early generations, because they use water to boil it, to uh, run the turbines, the electrical turbines, all right? But uh, in principle, this river should remain clean upstream and downstream of the power plant, of the nuclear power plant, because evidently, the uh, spent nuclear fuel is not pumped into the stream or anything of that sort. This is highly regulated industry and mm, the river should be clean uh, upstream and downstream of the plant. Now, a little bit of uh, history here. This started in the 60s, uh, the nuclear development. I remember uh, we're just two brothers, little anecdote here. My brother is a year and a half older than me. And so we were doing high school in Latin America at the time. My parents were living there. My dad was working for Alitalia in uh, Central America, Mexico and Central America. So um, when my brother was of age to go to college, it was 1969, uh, 68, sorry, 1968. And the, the nuclear energy industry was just coming into play. At that time, nuclear reactors, my brother, uh, when he was young, he wanted to be a nuclear physicist. And at that time, the only nuclear reactor in the United States that was available for uh, educational and research purposes was at uh, Sunny Stony Brook. Sunny is the State University of New York system, right? The State University 
of New York system, SUNY. And they have all different universities throughout the state of New York, just like in Florida, we have the state of Florida uh, university system like FIU, FAU, FSU, UF, uh, USF, et cetera, et cetera. They're all state universities of uh, Florida, right? Well, the same in New York, but of course, with a bigger, deeper pockets and bigger money to put into that educational system. And Stony Brook is up in Long Island at the tip of Long Island. And that was the only nuclear reactor that was available for education purposes and research purposes in the university system at that time, uh, the, the nuclear reactor. And so my brother started there at Sunny, uh, Stony Brook back then because in nuclear physics, uh, you need a nuclear reactor around to study the, the reactions and so forth, okay? All of the other nuclear reactors in the, in the US, all of the other nuclear reactors, right, from the 60s to the 70s, were classified uh, nuclear plants for defense and other research, but military research and so forth, okay? So they were not accessible to the public for, for educational purposes or research purposes. They were all uh, under uh, military or uh, classified mm, uh, uh, coding, whatever you call it, classification, all right? So that they were not available. So that was all at that time. Today, many universities uh, have their reactors or had their reactors, but you can see from these curves, there was a rise from the 60s to the 90s. So for about three decades, nuclear reactors were increasingly popular throughout uh, the world, not just in the United States. This is uh, global, these uh, graphs, all right? And this is measuring the output in gigawatts, the end result. So we see that these were actually active reactors and under construction, you can see, look at the two graphs, how they parallel each other, but they bump up the under construction bumps higher, right, than the active reactors. So there was an increase here in building nuclear reactors throughout the world, okay? And you can see that this curve on the upper graph kind of parallels this one of the active reactors, right, in production and output of gigawatts. So really pumping a lot of electricity into the grid into the electrical grid of uh, the world. Now, enter three accidents that gave uh, nuclear reactors a bad rap. Three Mile Island, right? Three Mile Island, uh, which I think it's, uh, where is it? Is it in Massachusetts? I forget, I don't know if you people are too young to remember the Three Mile accident, but I remember it. It is. There was uh, a meltdown at Three Mile Island. All right. Where is it? So, trying to find a state. Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania, right? Also Pennsylvania is one of the highest uh, production, produ producers of coal and petroleum. Um, and so they were trying to shift, make the shift into uh, energy that was not uh, fossil fuel. All right. But anyway, these were uh, reactors which were called first and second generation first and second generation uh, reactors. But that gave a lot of uh, bad publicity to nuclear that people uh, thought it was not safe, it's contaminated, the atmosphere is contaminating the soil with um, 
with radioactivity. And this radioactivity is long-term decay for uranium is uh, uh, hundreds of years. And so they, they thought that these plants were not safe. And then came uh, Chernobyl, but uh, 10 years later, that was in uh, the Soviet unit at the time. Chernobyl has been in the news lately. And some studies of the animals and plants that survived uh, uh, Chernobyl. Here's the meltdown that happened inside the plant. This was an actual real meltdown. You can see this whole side of the plant actually melted down, all right, from the, uh, from the accident. There's a fox going through, so now all that uh, the uh, radioactivity has uh, dissipated and so forth. And they're talking about uh, reclaiming the area of Chernobyl, perhaps not for nuclear uh, capacity, but uh, to reclaim the area. Anyway, Chernobyl was another big meltdown that happened, gave emphasize the danger of uh, nuclear energy, uh, nuclear reactors. And then even more recently, in the, uh, and when was it, 10, 2010 or 2011, uh, Fukushima, Fukushima in Japan, on the side here, some actual photos of uh, the burning occur. Actually, Fukushima, did not have a true meltdown. It was uh, uh, one of the reactors overreacted and uh, eventually there's a fire started, but the other reactor shut down. There was some uh, nuclear energy, uh, there was some radioactivity that leaked into the Pacific Ocean. Okay. Uh, but it was uh, not that much and it did cause some contamination. And then because of the uh, North Pacific gyre, what happened to that nuclear energy? It, that, uh, that radioactivity migrated north on the gyre, right? Remember the North Pacific gyre? Does it rotate clockwise or counterclockwise? The, in the North Hemisphere, it's clockwise. So it came across. Remember the California current that comes down the California coast <laughs> of the uh, United States. So uh, by the time it reached this area, it was basically dissipated into the Pacific Ocean and there was practically no uh, radioactivity left as it dissipated throughout the Pacific Ocean. And then of course that mixed in with the South Pacific and eventually that whole, um, um, nuclear energy, the, the, that radioactivity was dissipated throughout the oceans, all right, it was minimal impact. Of course, locally, it was a higher impact, uh, but not, again, not as much as the hype uh, that all this bad rap got for um, uh, Fukushima. But because of these three meltdowns or, or um, nuclear accidents, these plants got a bad rap. However, when you look at their history, it turns out that these are from the first uh, and second generation of nuclear plants, all right? First and second generation. We're now into third generation nuclear plants, which are not only much more efficient, much more safe, they have more redundancy of shutting down before there is an actual meltdown or before the actual core is affected. And they're much more efficient in using the rods, the, the, the uranium or whatever uh, nuclear material they're using. So they are much more safe overall. You see, it's gone through generations and iterations. Think of computers. We don't use the computers that we used 30, 40, 50 years ago. I was in college 30 years ago. I was in college uh, 50 years ago in the 1970s at FIU. I may have mentioned that uh, in 1970, computers were just coming into age 
and they were huge. They were the univacs. They were huge. They looked like refrigerators and they were connected to each other and they had these discs that went back and forth, a huge uh, complex uh, mechanism. They heated up so the room needed to be maintained very cold, like 50 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. Well, today our cell phones have much more capacity, uh, computing capacity than those huge univacs that existed 50 years ago. So there have been many, many generations, many iterations of the industry to uh, produce a much more compact, a much more safe and higher power uh, computer today, right? In our lives and it's all over the place. Uh, we're the same with nuclear plants. So these uh, are currently the ones that are still active in use today, these here, all right, are typically third generation. The previous generation plants are just being uh, shut down. They're being uh, shut down and they're called mothballed, right? Uh, uh, not used anymore and uh, repurposed for other things. Implants are fourth generation plants also that are even more efficient than the third generation. They don't even put out the vapor, so all of the water vapor is being used. They're totally clean in that sense. They're putting out nothing into the atmosphere, so there's not even the perception that anything is being dumped into the atmosphere, all right? There's a recycling of the vapor 100%. Uh, the plant itself is much more efficient in using the rods, so practically there's no spent rods. Uh, the, the, the uranium is used up, so there's practically no nuclear material left over, uh, radioactive material. And now in the plants are even fifth generation stations, uh, solar, solar uh, reactors, uh, sorry, nuclear reactors, fifth generation in the plants uh, that are even more efficient than the fourth generation. So certainly nuclear reactors have not gone away. They got a bad rap because of these three main uh, accidents, nuclear accidents that happened in three major industrialized nations of the world, the United States, and then back then the Soviet Union, and today uh, in, uh, in, in this uh, millennium, uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. But what I'm, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that the bang for the buck, all right? Nuclear energy has such a huge amount of energy stored in it, radioactivity, that it behooves us to work on these next generation reactors that make it uh, much more clean, more efficient, and more uh, energy, Mm, higher uh, output of energy and so forth, because the world continues to grow, the world continues to industrialize. We are forever hungry for electricity, mostly in the industrialized world, okay? And therefore, uh, it is a good transition, at least, at least transition, until we figure out the renewable energies that will supply the uh, energy hunger, the energy need that we have in the world. And so at least transitionally, all right, until we might eventually transition fully into totally renewable energy sources, nuclear is still a very, very good option with the newer generation of uh, nuclear power plants, which are much more safe than the previous generations that are already, like I say, first and second generations have been retired and decommissioned, all right? So that's the story on nuclear. Now, one final graph here before uh, we take a little break. Any questions or comments on nuclear? Look up these three, at least, read up on it a little bit on Three Mile Island, Chernobyl and Fukushima, just for background so that you know because Again, nuclear power plants in the public eye get bad rap, but they truly don't deserve it according to the science and according to the economy of what happened there. Okay, uh, so uh, look them up please and look up fourth and fifth generation nuclear reactors 
uh, and their safety and efficiency in producing electricity. All right, let's look a little bit at the big picture here. This is in the United States for the past uh, 200 years, 250 years more or less. Uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about since the Industrial Revolution, all right? Since the Industrial Revolution, what has been the energy consumption in the United States? What sources? So beginning like I say, let me see, 200, yeah, about 250 years ago, more or less, 270 years. It has been originally mostly coal for the first half century, right? For the first half century of industrialized USA, it was mostly coal. The cheapest one to burn it, boil that water to get the steam because of the steam engine, the steam engine. At one point, even the cars had a steam engine, <laughs> right? And certainly up until this day, uh, the steam engine is running. A lot of the industry and even some old locomotives were run by steam engine, right? The, 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 that whole, well, there are museum pieces now, but it's interesting to see a steam engine locomotive. And they were the big workers, uh, okay, uh, that were running, that were moving material in industrial quantity from one part of the nation to the other, and also in Europe. And here's a diagram where you have the combustion occurring here, heating up the coils that would produce the vapor in this, and that would run eventually the, uh, uh, are they called wheels? On the, on the locomotive, right? But of course, as you can see here, that burnt coal was producing CO2, which was pumped right out of the uh, chimney and the huge smoke ta smoke stack into the atmosphere. And then the second cart, remember the second cart was full of coal, chunks of coal, and the guys had to shovel coal into <laughs> the uh, chamber here. So pretty primitive, and yet this basically, this engine basically ran the uh, initial half century of the Industrial Revolution in the United States and in Europe, other parts of the world also. And so building tracks for locomotives, for, for uh, trains, was a big to-do in uh, the first century of the Industrial Revolution from the 1850s to the 1950s. Um, okay. Anyway, there was a gradual transition, as you see here, from the 1900s forward for the next century, from the 1900s to the 2000s, a shift from coal to petroleum. All right, so petroleum was replacing coal as the main source of energy in the United States. Out of the graph, very indicative, because this is all historical. At the same time, on top of the petroleum is also an increasing use of natural gas, you see? So it's an increasing use of natural gas. Follow each one of these curves, the shaded area, the area under the curve as it opens up, okay? Whereas for coal, is diminishing. So for petroleum, it opens. For natural gas, it also opens, right? So meaning more natural gas is being used. Then the blue and green here, dark blue is nuclear. You notice how it started in, uh, so in 1970s, precisely, 1960s, 1970s, in between the last century, the last second half of the 1900s, right? Second half of the 20th century, 1960s, 1970s, stars, opens up, but then kind of uh, levels off into the 2000s, 
So that's the transition here that is happening from one generation nuclear plant to the next as the old reactors are decommissioned and new generations are coming into play. So the net is kind of a, a wash, all right? And in the meantime, the light blue represents hydroelectric, which is going to be the next source of electricity, the next source of uh, energy for the United States. This is focusing in the US, you know, as an industrialized nation. Hydroelectric is there in the background, but that's the transition to renewable. So the little red dotted line here represents transition to renewable. And you see that hydroelectric started very humbly back a century ago in the 1900s, but has been increasing gradually and kept kind of a steady state. Now, more recently it has diminished because basically at this point, essentially all of the rivers in the United States have been dammed already, all right? So all of the rivers in the United States have been dammed and many of them have hydroelectric plants, not all, but those dams at the same time serve a purpose of a reservoir. So what used to be a river upstream of the dam becomes a reservoir, a lake, which holds now water. Yes, it does flood the local area, but then that water can either be used for agriculture, for recreation, and also for human consumption. So most rivers in the United States have been dammed at this point, which also points to the fact of the preciousness of water, all right? The other uh, liquid gold that uh, is uh, becoming increasingly difficult to obtain for human consumption. So hydroelectric is the next one. And then all other renewables are over here just starting toward the end of the 1900s, toward the end of the 20th century, right? Because these renewables uh, are heavily technological. They depend a lot on technology. But you notice how this little green curve and the area under the curve expands quite a bit. It's quite a nice expansion there. So the re renewables are gradually increasing into the 21st century where we can apply more and more technology that is cheaper technology to obtain these renewables. Okay, so only about 10%, if you look at the graph, only about 10% today of our energy sources in the US is coming from renewables. Look at this in a few pie charts. Let's see where we are. It's 1042. So, yeah, okay. So I'm going to stop after this uh, pie chart. I'm going to stop, take a break, and then we're going to transition fully into renewables, okay? Here's that 10% that I was talking about in the previous graph, right? But now put into a pie chart. So here's the 10% of renewables. The other 90% is still coming from mostly uh, uh, fossil fuel and uh, nuclear, okay? So this 90% uh, this is still contaminating, if you will. They're contributing to the greenhouse gases. It's mostly CO2. Then there is methane, nitrous oxide is also a greenhouse gas. And these F gases, these are fluoride gases, fluorocarbons, for example, which are now banned on the sprays, hairspray and all that. So these are the ones that are the, what we call greenhouse gases, the ones that retain heat and therefore warm up the atmosphere artificially above what nature can handle that excess four gigatons of the carbon budget, all right, from last lecture. These are the four main ones. Mm -hmm. Water vapor also holds gas, holds, uh, remember, because water has a high heat capacity. So water vapor also contributes to greenhouse, but the main ones are CO2, methane, and uh, nitrous oxide, because at least water 
vapor eventually condenses into clouds that precipitates onto the uh, uh, surface of the, of the earth. Okay. Right, when we compare to the rest of the world, we are producing uh, greenhouse gases at one fifth. So 22% of the greenhouse gases of the world come from the US. And the other 80% come from the rest of the world. Now I can tell you also, I didn't put it in this chart, but it would be interesting to see actually the biggest offender here, the biggest producer of greenhouse gases. Anyone know? Is one nature, which is also has- China. A China, exactly. And it's actually larger than us. I don't know exactly what it is, but maybe twice as much, something like that. China is the biggest right now single producer of greenhouse gases in the world because the problem with the industry and the corruption, they went from zero to 100% very fast in industrialization, right? Uh, when they did this magic of their economy, they went from a centralized economy to a market economy. So essentially they applied capitalistic principles into communism, which is something amazing, uh, but they still maintain a centralized government as we know, a totalitarian regime of, of the party of the Communist Party. And because of that, sadly, the level of bureaucracy and corruption is amazing. And therefore, even if they may have regulation on the laws, on the books, it's not applied or it's uh, corrupted. The point is that there's still a lot of contamination of the atmosphere, the, the, the uh, price to pay for that very fast ramping up uh, into industrialization in the past uh, half century is that um, they're producing a lot of CO2 to the day and contamination is a big, huge issue in uh, China, especially CO2 and uh, also the uh, just uh, air pollution. I don't know if you remember the Olympics, Beijing, uh, it just stuck in my mind. Uh, that that was a big issue when they ran the Olympics. Here it goes, photographs, there it is. <laughs> this is that famous nest egg that they built, a super stylized uh, stadium, right? To show that they have come up to uh, the contemporary world of, um, of uh, the industrialized nations and so forth. That is a world leader, yes, but uh, this was the type of contamination that was uh, occurring in Beijing at the time of the Olympics, as you can see there, mm -hmm. uh, before <laughs> and after. And this is the 2020 lockdown, <laughs> right? Where you don't see a car on the road, everything shut down. And so you can see quite drastic uh, the contamination before and after. Now let's see how long it takes to go back here um, after the shutdown of 2020. Uh, they're trying to implement a lot of regulation into the entity, of course, but the mechanism is such they're feeding also uh, and producing goods for one fifth of the world's population. And therefore they have massive, massive uh, issues, right? Anyway, it can be done. Uh, for example, with a pandemic, a pandemic will do it. Now we try to do it in less drastic ways. Okay, so this is kind of the uh, greenhouse gas uh, pollution of the world in a chart, kind of simplified, uh, just to reiterate that these are the main greenhouse gases uh, throughout the world, and we are contributing about one fifth of it right now, even with all the regulation that we do have in place, right? And the main offender here, of course, is still the fossil fuels. And so we're trying to get away from them. Okay, let's stop for a break. Questions, comments, anything? Well, if nothing, then I'm going to uh, break here. Pause, and we'll be back. Let's see, it's uh, 10 of 11, so we'll be back by 11. 
Okay, students, uh, welcome back. Now, uh, Rogelio was uh, asking about these percentages here. I want to point out that the graphs, the charts, the pie charts are showing consumption, all right? So in the US, 90% of the energy consumed comes from uh, greenhouse gases being produced. And 10% of the energy consumed comes from renewable energy. Then over here, uh, the text in black, these percentages represent this 10%. In other words, of this 10%, what item, what industry, what energy source is producing this 10%? And this is the breakdown, all right? So most of it comes from hydropower, from hydropower, in other words, a dam, hydroelectric dams. And then another large percentage comes from biofuels, practically half of the renewable energy that we use in the United States, that we consume in the United States, comes between these first two, uh, dams, hydroelectric dams, and biofuels. We'll look at those in a minute, what they mean. And the other half comes from these other five sources, biomass wood, wind, biomass waste, solar, and geothermal. Okay. Also to finish uh, the discourse we're talking about here on the pie, because it only shows the US, and actually this 22% is a little old, apparently I need to update this chart because I just went online and found a newer chart like this one. Oops, actually bigger than the previous slide here. Yes, you can see that uh, these updated uh, numbers for 2014, right? We're down to 15% of producing the uh, this, the uh, fossil fuels and uh, well, this is specifically uh, CO2, greenhouse. China is 30%, then Europe around 10, India a little under 10, Russia 5%, Japan 4%, and then this, all of these industrialized nations which add are one, two, three, four, five, seven, the six, one, two, three. These six nations together, we're producing 70% of the CO2 in the atmosphere. And all other countries, or close to 200 countries in the world, all right, all other 190 plus countries together are only producing 30%. It also points to industrialized, right? So these are the most industrialized nations in the world. Of course, here, Europe, EU, the European Union, this is actually at least a dozen, maybe 20 countries. I don't know how many are in the European Union, but uh, this is being seen as one country, <laughs> right? Uh, but there are many nations in here. But the point is that all of these are the industrialized nations in the world, pretty much. Uh, and we are still very much dependent on fossil fuels because it's the cheapest for industry. So that's the big challenge. The big challenge is to make it cost effective to transition into renewables. Not there yet, because the renewables are still technological. And technology costs money. All right, so let's look at these uh, seven sources. Hydroelectric, biofuel, biomass, wind, biomass waste, solar and geothermal. Beginning with hydroelectric, again, these are dams. And it's kind of a combination, it's a variety of how they actually produce the electricity, but you need somehow some kind of kinetic energy, right, to move those uh, turbines. And the kinetic energy is uh, generated by the downfall of the water internally through the dam. So here is uh, one particular dam. You can see the water gushing, but this is the excess. This is like the spillover. 
all right? Underneath the dam, here under control conditions will be a downward flow of water, and that downward flow will then spin the turbines that will generate the electricity pumped into the grid. So you have uh, turbines that are generating electricity here, and this is liquid water used as an alternative to water vapor, mm -hmm. just the liquid water. And that's about, in the United States, it's about one fifth, one fourth of the electricity that is coming from renewal. Another one, this biomass fuel. This is mostly uh, corn, but also other grain that is being used to produce um, gas, all right? Now, how is that production done? We start with crops. We have become so effective in growing crops because we have what is known as tertiary or quaternary agriculture. And what do I mean by that? Primary agriculture is just dropping a seed onto the ground and letting it grow by itself just with the sunlight that it gets and the rain that it gets. It's mostly a water issue, okay? Water management issue, but that's primary agriculture. Secondary agriculture is when we begin to form canals on the soil to channel the water, maybe from a river or a stream or a lake or a reservoir, channel the water just through canals that are made, uh, ditches that are made on the soil to get to the area where we planted the seed. That's secondary agriculture. Tertiary agriculture is to pipe maybe the water, to pipe it, all right, and so it's more effective. We have less water loss, we can control the flow of the water and so forth. Quaternary agriculture is when you bring in more machinery to harvest the crop, all right? So we are heavily industrialized. These things are called combines, and this fellow in there may spend the whole day inside this combine. Yes, he'll bring his lunch, maybe his dinner, maybe his breakfast, I don't know. But uh, this fellow is in a cabin, air conditioned, with all the supplies that uh, he or she needs for spending the day in here. And this huge machine, then he will drive this machine throughout the whole plot. As you can see here, this is a cornfield, mm, just, mm, grinding down corn, picking corn, this machine at the front, this combine uh, picks up the corn plant directly, which is already ripe, and somehow shuffles it into the base of the machine, and on the outside, on the back side, comes out ground up corn and feed and husk and all that, put into these large trailers, which are then taken into the factory for separation, separate, uh, separate the husk and the grain and so forth. Bottom line, from the cornfield or whatever grain it is, we want to end up with the corn itself, with the grain, with the grain, which the grain, let's go molecular for a moment, that grain is made up of what? It's got proteins, but it's mostly starch, right? Starch, and starch is what type of the four organic uh, groups? Carbohydrate, high energy bond. We do what with the carbohydrates, with the carbs? What do we do? We burn them, right? We burn the carbs when we exercise, metabolism. So we're back to the carbon-carbon bond, the covalent high energy bond in the carbs. So that's the, the energy source of the plant of the corn. Starch is a high energy molecule and it's uh, holding this potential energy of uh, the covalent bond. So all that is put through machinery so that the corn is mashed and then fermented. And what happens with fermentation is an alternative process to oxidation, to burning, to uh, respiration, all right? is anaerobic respiration, meaning that there's no oxygen involved. Rather, fermentation will produce gas, natural gas, 
which then is uh, distilled and dehydrated with water and so forth, and can be stored in tanks. It's mostly ethanol. And now this is liquefied. So the gas, uh, the fermentation product is liquefied into ethanol. And the ethanol now is mixed in with gasoline, right? So that's why the pumps will say up to 5% ethanol. And so what they're doing is they're saving, let's say this, uh, they're using this as an alternative biofuel. That's why it's a biofuel, but it's still being burnt. Mm -hmm. Now it's renewable in the sense that the crop is renewable because it's coming from biomass. So the renewable aspect of this is that it's coming from biomass. It's not burning fossil fuel as such, which is lost forever, but rather the crop can be uh, renewed, can be planted again. However, it does produce CO2 because at the end of the day is burning the biofuel, All right? Now, it's about one fifth, a little bit over one fifth in the United States, the production. So this is pretty significant when you consider that biomass biofuel produces about 22% of the renewable energy in the US. All right, it's almost up to par with hydroelectric. It's amazing. In fact, it's causing a problem for some farms because now farmers are getting more money for biofuel for their crop to make biofuel than to make to feed animals, All right? So the animal husbandry business is hurting. I'm talking about sheep, uh, well, mostly <clears throat> with cattle, pig, <clears throat> animal farms, right? <clears throat> uh, including poultry. <clears throat> that industry is hurting because now that industry of animal husbandry has to pay more for the feed to the farmer who's producing the feed because the farmer gets more money for their grain in biofuel industry. Follow? So what happens? That jacks up the price of the, the animal in the farm because it's now the, the animal husbandry industry has to pay more to feed their animal and therefore they are gonna pass on that extra charge to the consumer. And that will raise uh, the market price of poultry, uh, pig, cattle, etc. the meats in the market, right? So there's a challenge there, there's a transition. In fact, a number of farmers have uh, given up on feed altogether and just dedicate their crops now to biofuel, apparently, it's less effort to purify this thing than to produce the feed itself. So it's more cost effective to, uh, to pump into biofuel than to pump into animal feed. Okay. So these are the challenges that are occurring at the industrial level in the United States at the market level. And it has to be, it's a market economy. All right, so it's uh, supply and demand. Okay, so that's the second in a renewable energy source by volume. Uh, again, a little over one fifth of it. Next one, which is another one fifth more or less, is just burning wood. Basically burning wood from forests. Okay, from clearing forests or forests that are dedicated to producing uh, wood. So trees that uh, grow relatively fast. Typically they are deciduous trees and they are grown in tree farms for producing wood chip. And that wood chip is burned to produce the classical water vapor, to run the turbine, to generate electricity, to pump it into the grid. And the product of that burning of the chip is to produce ash. And la ash for now is going to landfills. Ash can also be mixed in soil, especially sandy soil, to make something that is called potash that may be used as a type of fertilizer that have, is rich in carbon. And it's a way of sinking the carbon, right? Because as long as the ash remains on the ground, 
then it's not up as CO2. Of course, this industry, this is a very simplified diagram. Uh, what is needed here to show is uh, the filters that are used for, for trapping the CO2 because when you have uh, burning, then CO2 is uh, naturally produced in burning, right? But the ash itself can be, again, um, mixed in with uh, sand and soil and trapped. So that could be a type of uh, sinking of the carbon. So wood biomass, about one fifth of the renewable energy in the US, but it does imply growing the wood chip. A shift now into other types of creativity, still using the turbine for producing electricity, but a clean turbine, a turbine that does not require water vapor or liquid water to run it, rather the wind. All right, so wind is also a fluid, it's a lighter fluid, it's a thinner fluid, but it's flowing nonetheless. And so why not profit from the flow of the wind as we profit from the flow of the river? Okay. And these are the wind turbines. Uh, they're pretty large, really, look at the scale. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, I've seen them, you can see them a little less in the US, of course, typically they're either along mountain ranges or along the coast where you have a nice uh, breeze blowing through. But uh, I've seen them quite a bit in Europe. Europe has gone more gun ho on the wind turbines. Mm. And it, since they have more mountainous regions also, the, the wind tunnels through the mountains and can generate more wind. And also the Northern Sea uh, between continental Europe and the British Isles. There are a lot of turbines there because uh, that is a high wind area and uh, wind patterns are fairly regular. But uh, look at the scale. These are, uh, these are trucks, lorries as they would be called, and these are cars down here. So you can see <laughs> they're pretty uh, huge. Okay? There's this version that has the um, uh, blades, it's typically the three blades. Uh, the turbine is in here huge turbine that is uh, turning, right, and generating by it can rotor and stator where generate electricity, which is then uh, trapped into cables and pumped into the grid uh, somehow underground here. An alternative, which is not too common, I haven't seen these too often uh, out in the, in the field, uh, but an alternative to these uh, turbines is these blades and uh, they, instead of moving uh, vertically, they, they, instead of moving horizontally, they move vertically and they can also rotate 360 degrees, whereas these turbines have to uh, turn with uh, the wind itself. But this is an alternative design and again, they're pretty large. You can see here is like a little shed house. So this would be like a human scale. Uh, anyway, it's an alternative. I don't know how popular these are really. I haven't seen them that much, but uh, this is the prevailing one, uh, the turbine, the, uh, the, uh, the helix, the blades. Okay, just generating in the US is generating about another 20% of the renewable energy. Some downsides of these, uh, at least a couple that you hear, uh, first they're kind of unsightly to some people. They're unsightly, all right? Well, it's uh, beauties in the eye of the beholder, right? So in some areas they may be unsightly if it's mostly a natural area, uh, hilly and so forth. Countryside, I know suddenly you have these, these uh, uh, windmills uh, sticking out. Uh, but if it's a more commercialized or industrial area, well, it's one more gadget on the horizon, right? So uh, that can be debated. The other one is that uh, it does kill some birds. Some birds, uh, flocks get uh, so sometimes collide with them and it does kill some birds. So there's uh, some concern there. I really haven't heard much about uh, other uh, negative issues. Of course, it does take technology and it does take maintenance, but uh, that's cost effective, right? The electricity that they get out of it, uh, more than supplies for the cost of maintaining the, the equipment. 
All right, another one, I'm just going by percentage here, and now we're dropping down to 5%. Okay, so we're from one-fifth to uh, 5%, uh, the next uh, couple, which is um, waste, solid waste, and then uh, solar also, it's about 5%. So together they form about 10% of the renewable energy in the US. But this one is Gulo burning, burning the trash, burning the trash but it's burned in, in a controlled fashion. Therefore, the trash comes in, just bulk trash comes into a chamber, which is uh, transitioned into another chamber where that, is, that uh, trash is burned. And the burning of the trash will uh, generate three things. On the energy side, it will generate uh, heat to warm up water, to boil water, to produce the steam, to run the turbine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, electricity into the grid. On the product of the burning, you get two things. You get the solid burn, which is the ash, and you have the gases that come out, mostly CO2, but also other gases. Most of this, you can imagine, is toxic gases, so they need to be filtered. Right? And all these are different types of filters so that what comes out of the stack, the small stack, is supposed to be just water vapor and gases that, are, that have been filtered out so that if there are gases here, they're not toxic gases. All right? So when the industry works well and it's regulated by government and so forth, um, then these filters filter out the toxic gases, including the CO2. Again, many of these filters are charcoal activated. It's called activated charcoal. Uh, it's a charged thing. And as the CO2 goes through the activated charcoal, that activated charcoal traps the CO2, in fact, sinking that CO2, but doing it artificially, doing it with uh, technology. The ash itself, will be taken to landfill, like I say, and layered perhaps with sand or soil or something like that to generate sedimentation, which is also producing uh, sinking of the CO2 of the uh, carbon, right? Carbon sinking. But it's done artificially, which takes technology, which uh, um, spends some cost. There is some cost in maintaining this factory uh, and keeping it clean, right? But they, by burning all, all that trash, because the initial product, the raw product is free. Well, free from the uh, dumping part, but it also takes money to get, collect the trash into the, uh, the, the trash uh, hills that we have here. What are they called, the trash mounts or? What do they call this, this garbage mounts that we have on the, in the city? Mm -hmm. All right. Landfills. Thank you very much. Landfills. That's it. All right. So that's producing uh, at the national level about 5% of electricity. Finally, solar. <laughs> okay. Solar, the downside that is only producing about 5% of the national uh, consumption of uh, renewables today, because as you can see, it's quite technologically driven, right? So it's still the technology is on the expensive side. Uh, there are two types of uh, solar, one that is direct producing electricity with uh, solar panels, otherwise known as photo photovoltaic cells. And another one that is uh, concentrated solar power, power, I'll talk about this in a minute, let me talk about the more popular one. These photovoltaic cells, the photocells, right, are mostly made out of uh, some type of silicone or silica. And what they do, these photocells, is they have an energy transition, an energy conversion from solar, from light energy to electrical energy, right? So, so, so photocells, that's why the word says photocell, it's a reference that they're using photons from light, which is typically from the ocean, from, from the ocean, cut me off, from the sun to 
voltaic to produce a voltage to produce electricity. So it's an energy transition. When you add all of the photocells in a panel, they're all wired with very tiny little thin wires into a main wire that will come out of the panel. And then when you put all those panels together, you can get quite an impressive voltage going through all that that is being produced just by the sunlight that is hitting that surface, whether the panels are there or not. Okay, so this is basically prophecy, profiting from a free energy source, which is sunlight. Mm -hmm. And so the southern states are the ones that are the most amenable to this because we have the largest sunlight exposure throughout the year. Uh, solar panels can also be uh, made today, manufactured, looking like tiles of different shapes and colors, so that even an entire roof can be made out of solar panels today. All right, and this is a futuristic uh, type of home. Looks pretty nice with solar panels. All of the roof is solar panels. And even the glass, now I was reading that uh, glass transparent at the microscopic level, photovoltaic cells can be embedded into glass, pane glass that is transparent, and it's actually a photovoltaic cell, right? So it's not seen by the naked eye, but at the microscopic level, it's there, and that glass pane will actually be generating electricity. A little bit of it, but every little bit helps, right? So if you have a lot of uh, glass in a house or a building, that can also generate electricity. Uh, even any, any kind of surface, even the, the uh, carport surface here, whatever you call that, the approach to the garage, that can also have photovoltaic cells in it with thicker type of glass that will receive with the, that is able to, um, to hold the weight of the cars in and out. So any horizontal surface pretty much can be made out of photovoltaic cells. Another type, which is very, very different, but it also uses sun as the energy source, is something called concentrated solar power, CSP, all right? Now this is a little different, what it does, all of these panels that you see that uh, are looking blue, these are not photovoltaic, photovoltaic panels, okay? These are not photocells. These are essentially mirrors, mirrors. And that's why uh, you get the transition in um, brightness here from very bright to shady, because these are all mirrors that are facing uh, over here to this bulb. This bulb is way up on top of a tower. And I'm not sure, I think it's some kind of metal all right, but it's a huge structure, huge. Again, look at the scale. This is a truck down here. All right, this is a warehouse. Uh, these are cars and trucks. So the scale is huge. You have this very high tower with a, some kind of a metal that is going to become white hot, white. It's beyond red hot. It's extremely hot, all right, because of the concentration of rays. I don't know if you've ever done that little experiment where you take a, um, a lupa, what do you call a lupa, and um, a lens, um, a magnifying glass, and you play with the magnifying glass until you get a concentration of the light onto your skin and it will burn your skin, right? You can burn paper, we used to, when we were kids, we like to light up a uh, little fire, light up paper by, with a magnifying glass. And so it gets very high concentrated uh, uh, high heat, and that heat somehow is conducted down by conductors, by, by uh, wires, okay, that are uh, high, heat, high heat conductors like copper, for example, and other metals that will conduct the heat down into the factory here. And at some point, that heat is going to be used to generate, to, to boil water, to generate vapor, to run the turbine, to generate electricity, okay? So this is the heat source for 
running a turbine and it's clean. There's no CO2 production, all right? And so it's clean, but it does take this kind of sophisticated uh, setup and that ball, because it is quite hot, it has to be way up there. It even has a shield underneath, you see. I'm guessing that this shield is for the reflection because just like the sun, you cannot, uh, you should not look at this directly with the naked eye. Mm -hmm. And these panels are oriented all to these mirrors to reflect the light and concentrate it on this uh, bulb way up here, all right? Of course, at night, the bulb is off because there's no sunlight to, <laughs> to run it. <laughs> okay, so these are two uh, solar energy sources, but combined, they're only producing right now about 5% because again, it's kind of high end on the technology. And therefore, unless it's done in, in huge quantities like this, it's not yet cost effective, right? Trying to keep the cost of electricity down. Finally, geothermal. Oops, what happened to geothermal? Oh, where am I? Yeah, here. Okay, geothermal. So this is going in the opposite direction in search for an energy source. Geothermal is not from outside the earth, but from the very core of the earth, through the mantle. We have the fact that the core, remember, is also white hot. And so the core is heating up the mantle, which is red hot. And then the mantle is heating the crust. And in some areas, it seeps through the cracks of the crust and it will produce volcanic activity or otherwise uh, geysers and so forth. So we can reach through the core, uh, not, sorry, not the core, through the crust into areas where it is hot and channel that hot water into steam to run the turbine using the geothermal energy, okay? So the hot energy of hot springs, if it's hot enough to produce vapor, then that vapor, that steam could run the turbines, which will generate electricity into the grid and then the hot water is cooled down to be injected back into uh, the soil, right? So basically in the big picture is using the heat that is inside the earth, geothermal, but there are not too many of these. And the long and the short is that they're only producing about 2% of today's renewables in the US. Again, just to be consistent, the white smoke that you see out here, what is that? water vapor, there's no CO2 involved in here, it's clean, right? Because steam is running turbines that produces the electricity, so there's no burning of anything. It's just steam that has been released out into the atmosphere. So clean, but small, a lot of technology involved, and you need the, the areas, not every surface of the US qualifies for this. You have to be uh, somewhere where the mantle comes close to the crust close enough to heat up that water. Okay, another chart. Let's look at the power sources, how they've been moving through the 50s up for, so this is in the past half century, the second half of uh, the 20th century, up until uh, uh, recent here, the 2010s, I think this is it. Yeah, each one of these is uh, five. So it's uh, 2005. What do we have? Coal. I didn't make the graphs of the colors. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not responsible for the colors, but they put coal in blue, <laughs> natural gas yellow, nuclear red, etc. This is the co color coding here. So the biggest one as you can see has been the past half century has been coal, but now it's dropping down since the 2000s, dropping down. So there is a downward slope here. This is by energy production, by electricity production. Then second one, just on the, on the scale, 
has been natural gas. So natural gas, in contrast to coal, is increasing. You notice that the slope here is rising on natural gas. The slope on coal is a negative slope, all right? So those are the trends. Nuclear rose in the second half of the 20th century, but then has leveled off for some time until we get those uh, new reactors up and running. It would be nice to see this uh, take up more of the slack, but for now it's leveled, all right? There's a net zero production there with the new generators as the old generators are being decommissioned. Then renewables in, in green. So renewables in green slowly but surely have been increasing steadily back and forth. A lot of this has to do with different administrations. We know that renewables have become politicized. So in the bipartisan system, one favors it, the other one disfavors it. So this may have to do with government incentives or lack thereof for that industry because it's still a fledging industry. And because it's highly technological, then uh, it needs the incentives from, from the government, right? Anyway, there it is in the production. It's, there's a slight uptick here, which is encouraging. Hopefully that positive slope can be maintained into this uh, third millennium. And then finally, Good old petroleum is down here. You notice that as far as energy production, generating uh, directly electricity, you see, because petroleum is being used for transportation, for fuels, so it does run industry, uh, electricity, but not at the level, at least of, of uh, residents, not residential electricity, right? and therefore has not played a very big picture, petroleum overall, in generating kilowatts for the grid out into residential area, which is most of the consumption of electricity in the United States. Yes, for industry and some for commerce, but not at the residential level. So that's why it's kept its lower profile than here and to a very low profile even uh, today. All right, uh, moving forward now into creative alternative for energy sources. Again, in the renewables, this is kind of a smattering of uh, things. Let's see, it's quarter of 12. So for example, let's start with the bulbs. We have seen a transition from the incandescent bulb. Yeah, quite hot, that little filament turns quite hot. So there is a lot of energy loss through what? Through heat that dissipates out into the environment, into the universe. So we, every incandescent bulb has contributed to entropy one way or another, which is uh, energy that is unavailable for work in the universe as heat dissipates through the universe, all right? So that was the classical incandescent bulb for decades in lighting essentially throughout the 1900s through the 20th century. Uh, all of the homes uh, everywhere. Now the transition first was to fluorescent bulbs, fluorescent lamp. So this coil is a mini fluorescent tube. And what does it have inside? It has gas that is, um, that is energized with a smaller amount of energy, of electricity. That gas is energized and here's a little uh, transformer or generator, whatever you want to call it, at the base to mm, make the gas uh, incandescent or to make the gas, not incandescent, sorry, misspoke, to make the gas fluorescent. In other words, to push the electrons to a higher energy level in the, um, in the gas, uh, sorry, the photons, so that that gas will then emit photons to generate electricity, to generate uh, light. So it's basically mm, stimulating the gas to go into fluorescence, all right? To give off uh, photons. And it takes comparatively less electricity to do that process than to make the good old little filament uh, incandescent to generate the same amount of uh, lumens, which is the measure 
does it have lumens in here? Yeah, lumens. You see, stick to this line here. This is kind of the equivalence. This is the equalizing the equalizer here. Uh, approximately the same amount of lumens are produced, which is a measure of amount of light in a room. Around 400, around 800 lumens, right? For the incandescent, it would take 60 watts. So this is a measure of electricity, of power, electrical power, current. So 60 watts to generate about 800 lumens for the incandescent, but only one third of that, 18 watts, to generate the same amount, approximately the same amount of lumens, and only one tenth, uh, one sixth of that, 10 uh, watts to generate the same with the LED. And LED is light emitting diode. LED, light emitting diode, is the acronym. The diode is a uh, chemical substance that, when receiving a small amount of electricity, will give off photons. Mm -hmm. And so it produces the same, the equivalent amount of lumens for a much smaller amount of electrical charge. So it's much more efficient. It also doesn't heat up. You can actually change them. I remember trying to change these guys when they went out. And if, it's, uh, if you try to change them too soon, you're gonna burn your fingers, right? So you use a handkerchief or a piece of cloth or something. <laughs> to try to get the ball because we were impatient and couldn't wait long enough for the ball to cool down. For these guys, you could just screw and unscrew because they don't get hot because it's, uh, the diode doesn't get hot. But you're gonna be doing that much fewer times because they last much longer. <laughs> they go into the years of the lifespan. They cost more originally, all right? So when you compare a light bulb, a classical light bulb of uh, $2, uh, to $12 for the LED, well, they cost six times more, yeah, but it's using six times less time of electricity. But look at this, it's going to last an average of 20 years, more than 20 years, as opposed to less than one year for the incandescent. So when you do that math, the price of lumen per lumen comes down to about one six less than the incandescent bulb for LED, right? And the fluorescent is still on the high end of things, even though they can last up to 10 years, uh, approximately 10 years, but it's still on the high end when you figure out the price per uh, uh, annual cost they're putting here, okay? Of course, there's fluctuations with the market back and forth, but it's a rough estimate. Bottom line, if you still have incandescent bulbs at home, change them, make the investment, put LEDs. If you have still have fluorescent, get rid of them, put LEDs, because that's gonna lower down your electric bill. It may be a little long-term, but uh, you will be saving, all right? Other energy sources, electric car. My car happens to be one like this one. It's a Nissan, uh, what is this, Nissan uh, Leaf. It's called the Leaf. And it looks just like it. It's a 2015 model. Uh, so it's old now, the new models. Okay, so let's talk about range. My car, my electric car, which I bought all, uh, old, I bought used about it three years old, all right? The range on the battery, so that's the challenge. The range on the battery is only about 90 miles per charge. So. I can only drive for 90 miles before it stops. <laughs> it runs out of electricity. And I gotta recharge it before then, you know, so 90 miles should be the round trip. <laughs> so effectively only 45 miles out and then the other five back, the other 45 back. But uh, so that's the disadvantage up front, which is the limited range. Now I'm talking a little historical here because I'm talking about a model that is five to six years old, all right? Uh, <clears throat> So the advantage, basically what it has, you see has a very short front end because there's no, electric, there's no um, gas motor. What it doesn't have, what this car, the electric car doesn't have, it doesn't have pistons. It doesn't have uh, gasoline for sure. So there's no gas tank. There's no uh, gas, gasoline filter. There's no pistons, no transmission. There's no oil change. Um, 
there's no radiator. In other words, it's a very simple car. It only has an electrical motor and a huge battery underneath the, the, the car, underneath the chassis, all right, which is at the lowest point. So it also has a very low center of gravity because that battery is the single most heavy item on the car and it makes it bottom heavy, so very, very stable. You can turn a corner at high speed and it will not flip over because it has a very low center of gravity, all right? It also pushes the seating up a little bit because you have to make room for all those batteries down there. So it sits a little high and I can typically see, this is a car, this is not an SUV, it's a little hatchback, right? So the, the back comes up, little hatchback, and uh, it's, a, it's a four or five seater, four door. So it's a car, not an SUV. And yet, when I'm on the road, I can see above most, uh, above the roof of most other cars. So it sits a little higher without having to be an SUV. It sits a little higher than the rest of the cars. So I can see above, it gives me more visibility, <laughs> in other words, than the average gasoline car that tends to sit lower on the ground. Anyway, uh, a lot of advantages. Uh, the only disadvantage is the range. Right, there's essentially no maintenance. For five years, I keep taking it back to the agency and they tell me, well, what do you want me to check? What do you want us to check? Because there's nothing to check here, right? It's just the, uh, the fluids of uh, what? The windshield wiper water and uh, what else? Uh, the air conditioning uh, fluid. Uh, it has also uh, what is known as regenerative braking. Regenerative braking is this. So the car has, of course, an accelerator pedal. It has a uh, brake pedal. It drives like a regular car, right? It has a steering wheel, has a seat, has air conditioning, has radio. <laughs> it drives like a regular car. Uh, but internally, the mechanics and the electronics are so different. It's just fascinating. For example, uh, I'm driving around, okay? And uh, so there's a stoplight. There's a there's a traffic light. And what happens when we come up to a traffic light and the, and the light turns red, we take off the foot from the accelerator, right? We release the accelerator and normally we start hitting on the brakes. So we, when we take off the foot from the accelerator, now the car is coasting and it's coasting down. So it's decelerating passively toward the red light. But typically because of inertia, a gasoline car has too much inertia with it. And so what happens is sooner or later we have to hit the brakes to decelerate the car down to a full stop because the light is red. And unless I wanna crash through the light and the other cars in front of me, I gotta hit the brakes and bring the car to a stop. So that's deceleration. And I'm doing active deceleration by friction of the gas, of the, sorry, of the um, brake pedals against the, the the drum of the tires, right? So there's an active process there. It produces uh, heat, which is wasted, and the actual pedals uh, wear out over time. I'm using braking system. I'm using the braking system of the car, which uh, takes up energy. It's a consumption. That's in a normal gasoline car. Think about the electric car. It does have a brake pedal, okay? So I can brake the car <laughs> down to, to full stop. Uh, but as soon as I take off my foot from the accelerator, right, the car now is coasting. And that inertia is turning the wheels. And so the electric motor, which is connected directly, that's why it doesn't have a transmission because it's direct, it's direct drive, it's called direct drive. In other words, when I'm accelerating the car, the electric motor is directly placed to the axis, to the rear axis. Some have it in the front axis, some have it in the rear axis, but the electric motor is directly connected to the axis of the car, of the tires. So when I give it electricity through the accelerator, that electricity goes directly to the electrical motor and turns the wheels directly. There's no transmission, there's no transition. So there are no uh, speeds. It's a, the speed is simply controlled by the amount of electricity that goes into the electrical motor. If I step on the accelerator and give it more electricity, 
and the motor turns faster. So it actually, um, it's a direct drive and there are no intermediates, there's no slag. As soon as I push the accelerator, that car jumps forward quickly, okay? Uh, of course, I can regulate, I can moderate, so it doesn't have to be going fast all the time. I can moderate it, but uh, there's no loss of energy in the transmission and no transmission that can go bad, uh, and no transmission fluid, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, um, back to the braking system. Because the axis of the tires is directly connected to the electrical motor, as soon as I take my foot off the accelerator, now the car is coasting, right? And that uh, inertia of the car is transmitted to the motor through the tires, through the axis. So now the axis is turning the motor. Instead of the motor turning the axis, now the motion reverses. We have the axis now turning the motor. And so the motor, the electrical motor becomes a generator, a generator of electricity. And that electricity is pumped back into the battery. And so that's why it's called regenerative braking because it regenerates the battery of electricity from the coasting of the car, from the inertia, all right? Number one. Number two, I also save because I'm not stepping on the brake. The car is actually braking by itself. The car is slowing down by itself because of the, uh, the energy that is used, the axis in, in generating that electricity is producing some friction inside the electrical motor. And so that generator is braking the car slowly but surely. And so I noticed that uh, uh, the car is uh, coasting down, all right, faster than a gasoline car. So if we have two cars going parallel to each other at the same speed, and we both release the accelerator, both cars will begin coasting, right? But the one will come to a stop, the electrical car will come to a stop further, it will brake faster because of the regeneration that's occurring. Whereas the other gasoline car is just coasting by itself and is slowing down by natural friction, all right? And so that's kind of a downside in the sense that when I take off what that does functionally, and I notice it through the rear view mirror, if I take my foot off the accelerator, my car, my electric car, starts braking passively, but because I have not stepped on the brakes, the brake lights don't come on. So the guy behind me doesn't know that I'm braking, all right, that the car is braking. And they come up to the car, they tend to come up to the car in the back. Of course, now they have to brake because they were just coasting into the red light. So now they have to brake or they have to come around me, <laughs> which is what I noticed. So what I do is, instead of just letting go of the pedal, of the, um, of the um, accelerator, I let it go slowly, all right? So that it gets closer to the light. And I'm not using that regenerative brake as much. But if I were to use it full-fledged, what it does is it saves on the brakes. Because basically, and I do it when I don't have any cars behind me, all right? Then I coast into the red light. And then I just have to brake the, the, the final five or 10 feet. So I'm using the, the brake very little, and my brakes last years and years, it's been five years, I haven't changed the brakes. You know, I keep taking it too, and the pads are practically new, because I use it very little, all right? And so that's another advantage. It really is a very, very efficient technology. Now the cost, what happens is, uh, because it's in the market economy, and these electrical cars are competing with the gasoline cars and so forth, uh, it's the same kind of brake off as the uh, traditional gasoline car. When does a gasoline car devaluate on average? On what year? On the third year. Typically on the third year. So you get, you brand, you get a brand new car, you buy a new car, and the price will devaluate most around the third year. 
that's normally when they, for example, the rental agencies, they change your cars. You know, on the third year, you find the rental cars out for sale. And it's done by the lotteries and by the big, uh, oh, it's all in the market economy anyway, but uh, the car industry, car dealership industry has it all regulated. Um, but basically on the third year, the, the gasoline cars devaluate uh, the most, right? And then they kind of slope down more gradually until they break down. So the electric cars are following kind of the same slope simply because they have to compete in the market economy. All this to say that my car, this Nissan Leaf, back in 2015 new off the assembly line was mid-range, uh, a little on the high. So the electric cars today range between 20, new, new, between 25,000 to 35,000 approximately. So average is 30,000, 30, which is kind of on the high end of an average car, right? High end of a sedan or something like that. Uh, about 30,000 new. So that's what the price of this one was uh, off the assembly line around there, 30, between 30 and 35,000. I don't know exactly how much it was, uh, but that was new. Like I said, I bought it three years old when it had taken its highest depreciation. I paid $8,000 for it, okay? But it only had a mileage, three years, only had about 25,000 miles on it. So very, very good mileage. Obviously, it must have been some kind of an old person who drove it just to the supermarket next door and then back to their home. <laughs> and drove it very little, had very low mileage. And so it was sold as certified. I didn't know this category. I'm not a car dealer, guys. I'm not trying to sell you a car, okay? I'm just trying to give you the experience that I went through a few years ago that I bought a car that was practically, practically brand new for $8,000. Okay, and doesn't use any electricity at all. I just recharge it at home with regular 110 volts overnight and drive it through the day. But um, to stay on with the price a little bit, so these, some cars are, used cars are called certified, all right? And certified is that the car is in such good shape that the dealership is willing to give you the factory warranty for, typically like a thousand dollars. So I paid an extra thousand dollars to get a fire, uh, factory warranty as if it were brand new, which means a hundred thousand miles or 10 years, whichever comes first. Okay, bumper to bumper. Factory warranty, hundred thousand miles, 10 years for another thousand. So practically for $9,000 existentially, I drove out of there with practically a brand new car, all right? And what does it consume? It only consumes electricity. So how does the electricity pay off with gasoline? The estimate at the kilowatt hour of what it is between 15 or 20 cents, depends if you charge during the day or during the night, at night is cheaper uh, because there's less demand on the grid. It comes out to an average of about $200 a year of electricity. How much is paying for gas? Plus, how much you spend for oil change? Plus, how much you spend for deterioration of parts over time? Brakes, whatever breaks inside, whatever busts. This thing doesn't break down. It just doesn't break. It keeps going. It's like the like the ever ready bunny. It just keeps going and going and going. You know, recharge it overnight. Use use it during the day. Now this, like I say now, is like a six going on seven years old. 90 mile range that yes i'm not going to disney world i hate disney world anyway so i don't want to go there uh it's i bought the car for the majority of the use 99 percent of the time in a year i don't drive more than 90 miles you know when in particular in one day i don't drive more than 90 miles my home happens to be the the parish that i that i live at happens to be about uh, three miles away from here five miles three miles you know it's a five minute drive so, uh, and I can even recharge here because we have uh, chargers, electric chargers at the Gus Machado, the business school, by the way, another advantage if you have an electric car, they have chargers there for free, <laughs> okay? And so you can charge, recharge your electric car at the business uh, building uh, for free. They have three stations, two of which are already broken. I have to complain about that. <laughs> All right, so now, 
historically, all this is historical back to about six or seven years ago, Natty Mile was the big uh, negative on these cars, right? What about the positive? This technology is ramping up. Today, the average for an electric car to be competitive in the market is between 250 to 300 mile range on a full charge. 250 to 300 mile range on a full charge. You know, so it's more than three times the original uh, load and uh, the range is about the same and there's an increasing number of electrical vehicles out in the market, truly EV. I'm not talking about hybrid. Hybrid to me is a scam because with hybrid, the different types of hybrid, mostly electrical, mostly gasoline, but with hybrid and the end of the day you end up with two motors. You get an electric motor and you still have a gasoline motor, all right? Even if it's just backup, which can break down and so you're back to the old piston mentality. So hybrid to me is not the way. Pure EV, electrical vehicles are called EV. And uh, so now, because there is an increasing number of different brands out in the market, there's more competition. And again, the market economy, right? So they're staying in that average of 30,000 more or less, between 25 to 30,000 new. But now you get to 150 to 300 mile range on it. It's looking better, right? Of course, the high end on these guys is the Tesla. The original Tesla was like $80,000 or something like that. Now they came out with, I think it's called the Model 3, which is about 30,000, okay? And uh, a number of companies are going um, uh, full electric. And in the US also a number of American companies because Visa of course is Japanese, uh, European and Japanese were the first on electric cars. Why? Because what we pay for a gallon, they pay for a liter. And how many liters to a gallon? Four liters to a gallon. Therefore, they pay about four times as much for their gasoline that we pay in, in our US. And so they had a greater incentive for electricity, for electrical cars in Europe and in um, and in Japan, right? And the technology was more advanced and so forth. And they tend to be smaller cars anyway. Uh, so they use less electricity. Parking in urban areas is also a big deal. So small cars, there's this little car called the Golf. And the Golf, you can actually park uh, vertically. You can park two Golfs in the size, in the parking space of a regular car. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, they park them in vertically like that instead of uh, parallel parking. Anyway, a lot of advantages to electrical cars. Believe me, it is the future. The technology keeps increasing on it and making it more affordable. It's still a little bit on the high end and we need to move it or the, the business world needs to move it, the market economy, into middle class, into the middle class America, middle class uh, world, so that it's more affordable and certainly uh, uh, much greener, the footprint is minimal compared to um, the gasoline car or trucks or diesel or any of that, okay? All right, uh, staying with transportation for a moment. Also here is, as you can see, a, um, this is a train that is run by magnets. So the rail, is one huge magnet. It's essentially one single, it's a monorail, as you can see, kind of wide. And then it's floating. See how it's empty underneath, all right? So this a train is being run by a magnetic current, a magnetic pulse that is transmitted down the rail. And there goes the railroad on top of it. The train will move along. What's, excuse me, the big advantage of this, no friction, right? So trains tend to be heavy, whether it's cargo or passenger, they are heavy machinery, they weigh a lot. If they're gonna be effective in transporting mass transportation, again, either cargo or passenger. And so one big loss of energy, heat, 
into the atmosphere that is lost, that is a negative, that is a cost to the system, is friction, right? So by generating, by designing and creating, engineering a train that is frictionless, then that's a big saving there, all right? And that's the future. It's another use of electricity and electromagnetic wave is uh, down the, uh, the rail there. Okay, so that's mass transit, mass transportation. Again, either passenger or cargo will work. Mm. Another sources of energy that are being uh, used. For example, this is a wave a machine. It's a series of tubes and what it's using is, you can see the wave coming in here. That's the crest of the wave. Then there would be the trough of the wave. There are about three waves here. Here's one crest and the trough, here's the second wave and a trough, and here's a third wave crest, right? What it's doing to the tube is moving the tube up and down like that, and internally that motion up and down is being used to uh, generate electricity, essentially. And what, that's what the tube does internally. It generates electricity by rubbing the stators and generating static electricity, which can then be a uh, pump uh, channeled by a wire down the front end where it's holding, I guess this is the front end of the tube, and it just orients itself directly uh, in, the, uh, in the direction of the current, where the current is coming. Another one that was uh, also a creative idea here on the coastline, as you can see, these are photographs, is when the wave is coming to shore. And this one more on the tide, all right? So as the tide uh, rises, these things will rise. As the tide recedes, they will, these floaters will go down. And that motion here, again, is moving up and down. So anything that has motion is kinetic energy that can generate electricity, can be channeled to generate electricity by stators rubbing each other, essentially static energy that can be channeled into the grid, all right? So these are creative ideas, as you can see, photographs, so they're in use. Mm, using plant material now, going green uh, by using plant material. Uh, a couple of these websites, let's see if we have time. These are very short videos. for the ad, the risque ad. Make this big and ready to go, sound. Ah, hold it, hold it. Maximize, where is it? Optimize for video. Okay. Plants like these could soon provide our electricity. In a small way, they already are in research laboratories and greenhouses at Project Plant E, a university and commercially sponsored research group at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. It's called the plant microbial fuel cell and can generate electricity from the natural interaction between plant roots and soil bacteria. It works by taking advantage of the up to 70% of organic material produced via photosynthesis that can't be used by the plant and is excreted through the roots. As naturally occurring bacteria around the roots break down this organic residue, electrons are released as a waste product. An electrode absorbs them and generates electricity. Solar panels are making more energy per square meter, but we expect to reduce the costs of our system technology in the future. And our system can be used for different applications. Plant and microbial fuel cells can be used on various scales. An experimental 15 square meter model can produce enough electricity to power a computer notebook. 
Our system can be used for different applications. Our technology is making electricity, but also could be used as roof insulation or as a water collector. On a bigger scale, it's possible to produce rice and electricity at the same time and in that way to combine food and energy production. And as we op een gegeven moment echt grootschalig deze technologie gaan toepassen, dan kunnen we bijvoorbeeld ook uh, op hetzelfde oppervlak rijst produceren en elektriciteit. A first prototype of a green electricity roof was installed on one building at Wageningen University and researchers are keeping a close eye on what's growing there. Okay, so this is the creativity of the mind using bacteria essentially, bacteria underground that uh, break down the excess nutrients from plants in the soil. And then that uh, breakdown metabolism generates electricity, generates uh, electrons, which can be trapped by um, electrodes introduced into the ground and channel that into a wire that will then uh, carry the electricity somewhere, all right? So it's a small amount per plant, but when you start adding acreage after acreage of uh, greenery, all of the electricity really that is underneath the ground, underneath the soil, that right now is not being used. Let's look at another little one. This is with algae, it's a little more involved in a, uh, factory, algae factory. <laughs> In Iowa, where corn is almost a religion, a new faith may be taking root. This is algae growing out of solution. It looks just like a cornfield. We run the harvester. This our harvester reminds us of a combine pulling off the algae. Algae? Isn't that something we usually try to get rid of? You can actually crack the code on actually growing and harvesting algae and getting this biomass. The application for this biomass is really incredible. You can use it to feed animals, you can use it to feed people, you can take its very high value in proteins. You can use it to fuel your cars, you can get the oil out of that. So when you look at algae, that's why so much interest is in it because it has such a wide application in so many different sources. In addition to its biofuel possibilities, algae is already being used in all kinds of ways you might not be aware of. Food products, baby formula, or nutritional supplements like spirulina. Algae contains the all-important nutrient, omega-3 fatty acids. It's all about omega-3s, and the world is short omega-3s. They're long omega-6s and omega-7s, but they're short omega-3s. And algae may have the best ability to solve the shortage of omega-3s in the world at the highest quantity. Quantity, that's what they're trying to tackle here in Shenandoah, Iowa. In an unusual pairing, a traditional corn ethanol plant is supporting algae production, a next-generation biofuel. It turns out corn has what algae needs. A third of the kernel is starch being converted into fuel. A third of the kernel is fiber being converted into animal feed. And there's a third left. And all that is being today is being converted into CO2 in the atmosphere. So we could actually take that other third of the kernel that we're basically emitting into the atmosphere, capture it, and create a whole other product around how we convert CO2, warm water, waste heat, and sunlight into algae. CO2, wastewater, and heat, all byproducts of producing corn ethanol, exactly what algae needs. And this joint project called Bioprocess Algae is the result of an unlikely partnership. This whole process has been serendipitous. Todd Becker, CEO of Green Plains Renewable Energy, a major producer of corn ethanol, and Tim Burns, CEO of Bioprocess H2O, a water treatment company whose technology has been used to get algae out of water how to keep algae out of wastewater systems. We have a lot of knowledge, and that knowledge gave us the opportunity to bring it into how we can grow algae, and we knew that with our system. The heart of it is attached growth. We have a system in which we provide a lot of surface area for the algae. Basically, think of a condominium for the algae to reside on. And that condominium provides a lot of surface area, so we have a big mass transfer device. Think of it that way. So on a typical open pond system, which algae's traditionally grown on, we would be about 40 times the surface area of a system. So it gives us a lot of opportunity to be more cost effective. Let's say an acre of land. An acre of land that produces corn today in the United States produces seven tons per acre. 
Our goal in these reactors is to get 15 to 40 tons per acre of product. And instead of a once a year harvest, algae is harvested several times a week. The idea of getting gas and oil from algae is really not new. In fact, it's millions of years old. All our oil today is ancient algae deposits, compaction of hundreds of millions of years of riverbeds and compaction of algae already. What we're trying to do is accelerate with the process and to what Mother Nature has done so effectively and start to industrialize it and produce by our process. The stumbling block is cost. But recent breakthroughs promise to reduce that cost. At the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, researchers have developed a technology that uses extreme pressure and high temperatures to accomplish in minutes what nature has done over millions of years, convert algae into oil. Still, to be cost effective, algae needs to be grown in high volume, and co-locating algae production with a corn ethanol plant might point the way. You basically can use free inputs, the sunlight, wastewater, warm water, heat, and CO2, and there's a lot of all of that available. And so if you actually combine all that, you actually take something that is really free and you're gonna create something with a lot of value. And in the process, they just might be teaching the rest of the world a new way to look at that greenhouse gas, CO2. Instead of a pollutant, it could become a product. If you think about the ability to utilize greenhouse gases and CO2. Algae, in my opinion, is the only profitable use of CO2 currently on the market. So if you're able to profitably use that CO2 portion, that's gonna give you opportunity to mitigate the rest of the CO2 emission. Reducing CO2 emissions while growing a renewable and sustainable fuel source that could mean less expensive gas. That is the promise of algae. It may be a while before algae dethrones corn in this part of the world, but as this remarkable experiment is demonstrating, there's no reason they can't get along. Okay, so human creativity and ingenuity. Fantastic. Okay, it's a little further up. Transportation, okay, I'm not gonna belabor the point here. Uh, electricity is being used. Oh yeah, the hydrogen fuel, this is an alternative. And just to cut to the chase here, hydrogen, because it's highly flammable, it's not that uh, convenient for uh, transportation at the, at the individual level for cars, uh, but at the mass level also, because hydrogen is expensive to produce. It's such a small amount in the atmosphere, right? Uh, that part per million, basically, that it's, uh, there has to be hydrogen plants to produce the hydrogen to be uh, stored then in cells. And now these cells are very effective in trapping hydrogen so that they don't, um, sorry, this is a hydrolysis process by which uh, hydrogen would be produced. The point is this, um, Hydrogen now can be safely stored in cells, in gel, to be used for transportation, but the production of the hydrogen is kind of expensive and it doesn't pay off for individual cars. So it does pay off for commercial or industrial, for heavy machinery, for public transportation, that's where hydrogen fuel cells and hydrogen uh, to run motors may pay off, all right, in, in large scale, but not for individual cars because um, a car is not gonna have, each resident is not gonna have a hydrogen producing plant in their house. It's too dangerous, it explodes and so forth. It has to be regulated and it's, not, it's uh, at least so far is not uh, safe enough to be used by cars, but it can be used in mass transportation more effectively and cost effective. So that's another one to look at for the future is hydrogen combustion. 
moving along in other areas, uh, passive heating and passive cooling can be used. Here's a solar water heater that doesn't use photovoltaic cells, doesn't use photo cells, it's just putting a coil of tubing out exposed to the sunlight and the sun will heat that tube. The tube will transmit the heat into the water and now you get a hot water tank essentially up on the roof, all right? And that water is being heated passively by the sunlight. Uh, so no photo cells here. It's just a water tank that is being, the water is being heated by uh, sunlight. Uh, also uh, passive heating by allowing sunlight to come in on the sunlit part of the house. And once it goes through the, the panel, the, the, the glass panel, that will heat up inside, that, that light will heat up the house inside. And so you can have passive uh, heating. This is good for up north houses in the temperate or cold, cold region where the house generally is oriented toward uh, the north. Alternatively, you can use solar cooling or passive cooling in the, in the design of the house when you put the exposure to the sun on the shady side and then air vents or clear stories above uh, near the ceiling because heat rises. And as heat rises, if you give it an exit upstairs, like in a clear story uh, uh, on, underneath the roof, in the ceiling, then that heat will rise out of the house and it will actually cool. It will bring cooler air in and it will cool the house, all right? So this would be a design of passive uh, cooling by allowing the heat as it rises to get out of the building, get out of the structure, and also planting plants that are on the exposed on the southern side, yeah, the southern exposure in the northern hemisphere it's to give shade to the house in the summertime when the leaves are there. But you notice it's a deciduous tree. So in the winter time, these leaves drop off and then the sun is allowed to heat the house uh, through the twigs and through the branches of the tree instead of generating shade, all right? So it's important to be a deciduous tree in the temperate region. <laughs> Another one, change the tank, the water tank to a Titan or a tankless water heater. Titan is the brand, but it's the most common brand that is known, all right? But it's known as a tankless water heater. What this does is it's hooked up to the electricity. Yes, it does require a dedicated line of uh, 220, uh, but it, it hooks up to this little machine, hooks up to electricity, and there are uh, coils in here that heat up the water as the water flows through. So the idea is that this water is only being heated up when people are taking showers or you turn on the hot water uh, faucet and so forth, and you don't need to keep a hot water tank all day and all night hot when you're only using it a fraction of the time, when, when one showers or when one uses the hot water, but one is not emptying this tank all the time, right? It would be very expensive and a waste of hot water. So only when the, water, uh, when the hot water is used, does the tankless water uh, heat up the water. And so it's much more efficient. It saves on energy, on electricity. Uh, and it's uh, once the, they say that practically, so if you had to have a, a hot water tank that is still fairly good, fairly new and so forth, leave it until it starts breaking. Sooner or later, there's gonna corrode. They're gonna start breaking down. When it's time to replace it, replace it with a tankless water heater. That's the time to replace and the added value is that you get a nice little storage area where that big old tank used to be. Okay, a couple of more. Quickly, we have the LEED buildings, the LEED buildings, all right? And LEED is an acronym for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. I'm going to let you read the details about this uh, on your own, basically, 
LEED certified, and it has several levels of certification here. It's got four levels of certification. A building that is LEED certified has some advantages, tax advantages. They will pay less taxes to the city or to the nation. They will save on, uh, on energy consumption. They will save on heating or cooling, all right? Because it uses a cluster of systems to make the building more eco-friendly. And there will be um, several issues from solar panels. For example, this house having solar panels and other things like the cellar is probably gonna be very cool down there. A factory can also be used. There's a, a factory, a food factory in Ohio that is LEED certified uh, buildings in DC. This one, is the kind of the flagship. I think that this is platinum certified actually, is the highest uh, uh, certification of a LEED building. It was expensive to make for sure, but it saves going forward. It's like an investment because over the years and the decades, this building is meant to be here for decades and it saves a lot on energy, either heating or cooling the building, all right? And so that is part of this LEED certification, trying to move the building industry into being much more eco-friendly. And it's a whole system um, of not only the construction, but the operation and the maintenance of the building, uh, how the whole building is put together and functions with the environment. Typically they have a lot of passive light coming in and LEDs and so forth um, is down to the level of the design, uh, the, the architectural design of the building. Okay, but LEED certification, this building in the science building was supposed to be a LEED building way back when it was designed in the uh, early 2000s, uh, but then the cost got too high for the previous administration, didn't want to pay that much for the building. So they cut down on, on a number of things. And at some point we lost the certification. We, we, it did not qualify anymore, but this was supposed to be a model for the university and the community because it's a science and technology building. And so it stands to reason that it would be a lead building, but we lost it unfortunately. Short side, my opinion, that they didn't wanna spend money upfront in the construction. So now we're spending it in the broken air conditioning and buying the chiller, the chiller, the, and the heater and cooler and all the problems that we have in this building because of uh, it wasn't done up to speed to what it could have been. Okay, so bottom line, you pay now, you pay later, but you always pay. More on uh, solar, for example, I don't know if you follow the Solar Impulse 2. This was, uh, well, it's been five years now but I remember with, uh, with enthusiasm following this uh, flight, this first flight around the world, it was done in three or four stages. Of course, the thing had to land every now and then because the guys had to eat. Um, I think, I forget if it was solo, I think it was solo. Uh, but anyway, it was the first airplane that was totally uh, driven by solar panels, okay? And uh, it had, yeah, four motors on it. And these are panels, and it went around the world the first time. So an airplane can go around the world. This is proof of principle. There's a golden bridge, right, in uh, the Golden Gate in California. And it stopped like in three or four places along the way because it didn't have, not have enough energy storage to make it all the way across the Pacific. So it stopped somewhere in the middle of the Pacific and then kept going. All right, so you can look it up, Solar Impulse 2. It was very exciting when it happened. The ISS is the largest artifact that humanity has ever made. The International Space Station, going around the, the Earth now for a couple of decades. Uh, well, uh, what is that, 14, 15, 13 years? Has been all driven by solar panels. These are the solar panels out there. You can see that they're oriented toward the sun and whatnot and totally driven. This is the largest artifact, machine, thing, stuff that humanity has ever built. It's out in space, 
is the International Space Station. Uh, I think these are mostly the, the living quarters and experimental quarters here. And they, uh, it's totally driven by uh, solar panels. <laughs> okay. All right, so the, uh, there was a conference in uh, 2018, three years now. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, gathered. Here you see the major um, CEOs of these uh, fossil fuel industry and natural gas. Exxon, Eni, which is the Italian, uh, Ente Nazionale Italiana, of uh, this equivalent to Exxon or Shell uh, in Italy. Okay, it's a nationalized uh, industry. British Petroleum, Royal Dutch, Norway Pemex is from Mexico, Petroleos Mexicanos, right? Uh, 40 CEOs of all the major fossil fuel companies of the world. Our Holy Father invited them for a nice uh, pasta dinner <laughs> at uh, the Vatican. And they came and he said to them in part in that discourse, I invite you to be the core of a group of leaders who envision the global energy transition in a way that will take into account all the peoples of the earth. You know, he's very big on uh, the marginalized, as well as future generations and all species and the ecosystem. Laudato Si, right? The, the environment, care for our common home. So here's the Holy Father trying to uh, exemplify leadership at the spiritual level. They came, they're heard, and now let's see if they act, right? So it's all about human creativity, which is an expression of the Holy Spirit. Let's uh, let that Holy Spirit work in us and through us so that we can be good stewards of creation and try to transition finally from the fossil fuels one way or to another uh, into renewable energies. I think we we'll always have some form of fossil fuels, but the filters get better and so forth, so that uh, we really have to cut down on the CO2, okay? That's the big, big offender. Those 400 ppm uh, are the big offender of the, uh, the gigatons that we have to bring down now, okay? All right, anything else? I'm gonna stop here. So thanks again for listening up. And now, if there are no questions, then I'll stop this. And we'll meet up again next Saturday. Okay. All the best. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Thank you all. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Professor.